plastic agent and now Escog's agent. She's been in sales her entire life. Judith was born and raised in Vancouver, but has lived most of her life in Toronto. A graduate of the University of Toronto in 1990 with a bachelor's degree, majoring in political science, and in 2003 from the Wycliffe College Seminary with a master's degree in divinity. Judith was ordained as deacon and priest in the Anglican Church the same year. She was in parish ministry for the next nine years as both curate in St. Andrew's Scarborough for two years and the incumbent of the Church of the Holy Spirit in Mississauga for seven years. Judith left parish ministry in 2012 with no fixed plans, but within four months she found herself at the Mission to Seafarers and six months later was appointed interim executive director during the process of amalgamation with Hamilton Mission to Seafarers. In January 2014, she was appointed executive director of the newly amalgamated Mission to Seafarers Southern Ontario. In June of 2017, that new mission expanded with the opening of the Terry Finlay Seafarers Center in Oshawa, named for our former liaison bishop. In October 2019, this month, Judith was appointed Regional Director of the newly incorporated Mission to Seafarers Canada, which includes stations in Vancouver, Thunder Bay, Sarnia, Lake St. Clair, Windsor, Hamilton, Toronto, Oshawa, St. John, and Halifax. We hope to add to that number during the next few years with mission stations in ports on both coasts. The granddaughter of a master mariner in the merchant service, Judith is an honorary member of the Great Lakes Division of the Master Mariners Association and sits on the board of directors for the Marine Club as chaplain. She's also the official port chaplain for the Ports of Ontario and Oshawa and senior port chaplain for Hamilton. In her abundant spare time, Judith enjoys photography, making jewelry, reading real books with pages, music, theater and films, and traveling, especially when it involves places of historical interest. However, it is her work with the Mission to Seafarers that has been the highlight of all three careers. Never a job, always a joy, as it is a joy to have you as the chaplain for Sheep Showdowns. And with that, we we'll give our guest a warm welcome. <coughs> skills are incredibly limited. As I tell people, I'm from the era of phone book, not Facebook. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, Mission to Seafarers is not something that is new to most of you in this room. Um, uh, my predecessor, Father David Mulholland, is sitting at the front table, and our former board chair, Duncan Harvey, is sitting next to him. Uh, and they have been around for many, many years at the Shellbacks. <coughs> um, there have been a lot of changes, uh, especially this year at uh, Mission to Sea Care. So uh, Diane and I thought last year that we would, uh, in the spring, that we would uh, just do a, a little recap here. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever actually been to this particular building. Show of hands. Oh, great. Okay. A number of you. Um, well, remember it fondly, it no longer exists, unfortunately. On the coldest night of the year, uh, the temperature in the port, I estimate, because the temperature given was around 47 <coughs> below zero Celsius. And I live right 10 minutes from the old office. Uh, I think it probably hit below 50 because it is always cold in that particular spot. The water main from the street to the port froze. The connector pipe from the water main into our building froze. And that was that only has one benefit in that the, they were trying to bill me for the 
for the frozen water main. And the, uh, the utility company said, oh, that was your name, that's the port. So I was, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> uh, because that was many thousands of dollars the port presented me with a bill. I said, it's not my problem. <laughs> so the feeder pipe froze and the resulting freezing literally exploded the entire sprinkler system inside the building. And uh, there was a flood between three and four feet of water because the center well, as you know, of the building was open. And so water from upstairs was going downstairs. And that's sort of the result, some of it, on the, uh, the left-hand side uh, are the, the pipes. You can see they're twisted like plastic straws. These are heavy cast iron pipes that literally pop open like balloons. Picture at the top on the right is the chapel. Uh, these are heavy wooden pews. They lift it up and tilt it over. Um, some of those things were, were not completely damaged, but the, they estimate by the, the, the look of the walls that the water was between three and four feet high. <coughs> the board table, our beautiful handmade board table, floated six feet across the room and ended up by the wall. I mean, the thing was so heavy, I don't know how it managed. The water destroyed it. But if there was one thing we learned about losing the building, it was that the mission work continued on, probably even more vigorously than before. There have been so many changes in downtown Toronto. For example, the city literally came to meet Queen's Key. The folks get off the sugar dock off the sugar ships at Red Path, and they can walk across the street to beginning with Loblaws, Tim Hortons, the sandwich shop, going up the street, and there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Uh, we would say to the seafarers, do you want to go over to the mission building? No, oh, no, too far, too far. When you've got four or five hours, you don't want to waste an hour getting there and an hour back if you're walking, or we would drive them over, but they weren't interested in coming over. Ships were not coming into Pier 51 until this past summer. And um, so there was, there was a whole sea change, shall I say, in, um, in how we deal with uh, the incoming seafarers. But they didn't need the building as much as they needed us. So we have continued to visit every single ship that's come in to Red Pack um, over the course of this season. And uh, we have a new ministry developing with cruise ships. Uh, the City of Toronto and the Port of Toronto are trying to build up the cruise ship business. So last year we had 11 ships, this year we had 23, next year they're anticipating over 40. So that'll be pretty fantastic. And again, for whatever reason, Pier 51 is the recipient of cargo. So there is a lot of cargo, mostly iron and uh, steel, that's coming in, which is only interesting because it used to go into Oshawa. But the head of the Ontario Stevedoring Group left Oshawa and moved to Logistec in Toronto, so now all those ships are going to Toronto. That's a political thing, and I'm not going there. But, uh, and then recently, Hamilton bought the Port of Oshawa. So now it's called the Hamilton Oshawa Port Authority, or as we refer to it, OPA. <laughs> so there have been a lot of changes in Toronto. The building itself was very expensive to maintain. And the destruction of the building, uh, as much as we were, we were trying to move it or sell it or re relocate it, we found out relocating it was going to cost $150,000. If you've got $150,000 to spare, I can tell you a million ways you could spend it, and one of them is not going to be moving the building. It would also, the insurance was going to cover the cost of replacement, but we would have had to have pay that and more again to bring the building back up to what we needed, a new roof, we needed all new walls, and you know, there was all kinds of issues. <coughs> so, <clears throat> uh, I remember sitting outside the port building, the Port Authority building, um, I was very, very ill at the time, and trying to figure out how I was going to get the building packed up in a month, and it was that following morning at three o'clock in the morning when the freeze happened. And it was like God said to me, go home and get some rest. I got you covered. And the next morning at 5.43, my phone rang with the harbor master saying, have you got a key to your building we could have? There's a flood. 
I didn't have to pack a, a box. God did all that for me. So ship visiting is one of the primary things that we do in the, in the Port of Toronto because uh, the, because we don't have the actual building any longer. But ship visiting is the primary focus of the Mission to Seafarers. Getting on board those vessels, making sure that things are okay on the vessel. You walk on board, you climb up the gangway, and you can tell in the first five minutes if things are all right. Is the ship clean? Are the guys clean? Seriously. Do they look fed? Are they skinny? Um, are they looking happy? Do they look disgruntled? There are all kinds of ways to make sure that these ships are, the people on board the ships are being well looked after. Um, <clears throat> our chaplains uh, like taking them across the street to coffee upstairs at Loblaws where they have a beautiful view of the ship, but any of their complaints cannot be heard. <laughs> So they sit upstairs above the Starbucks and they have little meetings and get-togethers up there and if there's any issues or problems, we find out about them in a big hurry. Um, but it's the ship visitors that are the strength of the Toronto mission and we have four of them uh, at the current moment, which is, which is really pretty outstanding. So ship visitors, this is a team of people from our Hamilton mission. Uh, this was the first day they actually ever went on board a ship. They did two weeks of training in Houston and not one minute was devoted to actually going on board a ship. So we drove up to this ship and one of the chaplains said, where's the elevator? How are we getting on board? I said, you see that stairs, that set of stairs? She said, you don't, you don't even have to walk up those, do you? I said, you bet. Three stories straight up. And um, we all went behind her, which didn't make her any more comfortable. But uh, she did okay. She did okay. Sharing a meal. Upper right-hand picture is uh, one of our Toronto chaplains, Deacon Michael Hull, wonderful man. And uh, they, what you can't see in front of him is a table full of food. And Pastor Dan on the left-hand side, uh, amazing man. We also refer to him as the Stuart McLean of the Mission to Seafarers. He has some of the world's greatest stories. I've just got to make sure he writes it down. And uh, the beaver hat ceremony in the bottom right, um, a couple of years ago with uh, former Harbor Master Angus Armstrong from Toronto and uh, the captain and chief of one of the, of the first ship in, in two years ago. So it's not about the building. I was taking a lot of flack for uh, a year about uh, shutting the building, building down. I was accused of closing the mission. How dare you close mission? I said, good grief. Mission's been operating since 1837. I could close it if I tried. You know, it was incorporated in England in 1856. We're not going anywhere. But it's very clear to us that the, the, the work of the mission, especially trying to explain this to clergy and clergy wannabes is it's about going out. Mission work is always about going out. Do you realize the Mission to Seafarers is the only actual Canadian mission? We have missionaries going to Africa. We've got them in South and North America. We've got them in Central America, rather. We've got them in Asia. But the Mission to Seafarers is an actual mission of the church, and it's located in Canada. Now we have 190 mission stations in 210 ports around the country, around the world. But it's always about mission work, going out. We don't sit in an office and wonder if anybody's gonna show up on Sunday. That, thank God, is not what our work is all about. Our work is about going out, taking things to the seafarers, being a part of their lives. We go to them, we don't wait for them to come to us. Um, in our Oshawa station, for example, we have a special visit card with our email address on it, which goes to the entire group of Oshawa volunteers. So as the ship is coming in, the seafarers ask for pickups at the various docks, east or west side of the, of the channel. And we're there to meet them at a specific time because the emails exchange has already happened. Our, we have a Google calendar, the volunteers jump over the Google, Google calendar, they sort out who's gonna go to which side when, pick up the seafarers and take them to wherever they need to go and bring them back to our mission, um, which is a 46 by 10 foot trailer. And I believe the Toronto mission started out like that way. 
40 years ago as a trailer. It was not the building that we saw. So, you know, it's, it's about the people. It's never about the building. It's about the speakers. Bells like these, Christmas bags. They were so excited to get their Christmas bags. In Hamilton a couple of years ago, I went on board with a parishioner from one of my, the churches I was serving in at that point. And we were there on the 22nd of December, a very cold day, and there was a lot of work going on around because they had two days to discharge and get back past the Lambert, St. Lambert's Lot and get out of uh, the St. Lawrence, heading to the ocean. And we climbed up the gangway, and we had these huge Ikea bags, you know, the great big Ikea bags, full of Christmas bags. And the word went out, they're yelling into their walkie-talkies, Christmas is here, Christmas, get out of here quick, Christmas is here. And they're so excited. Every single man on that ship was a Hindu. <laughs> but the, 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 that, the, the Christmas bag was everything to them. And that we did, you didn't forget us. We thought you'd forgotten us. I said, why would we forget you? 500 Christmas bags each year for the last two years we have delivered. Last year I had a team of four women representing the Canadian Board of Marine Underwriters who packed those bags in an hour and a half. The year before I had 15 young people who took eight hours and I had to repack every bag. <laughs> The four women had a system, this was there, and that was it, and that was it, 500 bags. It was brilliant. If I had more room on this presentation file, I could have sent them to you. The uh, bottom right photo is a fun one because we had not finished painting the Oshawa mission. You can see that it's just drywall, and uh, that bright green stripe reminds me that it was nowhere near being done. And, but we had Wi-Fi, so they marched up the street, their seven minute walk from the foot of the gangway, to the mission front door in Oshawa, and they wanted to come for a, a visit and check out the Wi-Fi. The other important part of our <coughs> mission team is most definitely our volunteers. Oshawa runs 100% on volunteers. I am the supervisor and the port chaplain, but they do 95% of the work, and they are utterly and completely amazing. This was uh, Jackie's first trip on board a ship. She has a daughter who's in the armed forces. And she got off the ship and texted her daughter and said, you will absolutely not believe what I have just been doing, <laughs> climbing on a ship. She, uh, we have a whole series of photos of her doing that. She was over the moon. And people of all different ages who have come to the mission in, uh, in the, all three missions, Toronto, Hamilton, and Oshawa, to do all kinds of yard work, painting. The entire interior of the Oshawa mission was painted by a group of folks who come from Aon Insurance. Every year, give us four individual hours, so we're talking about 40 hours, 45, 50 hours of work, and uh, they've done all kinds of wonderful things. This was a church group from Detroit. Um, my lovely, wonderful friend Tom, on the far right, uh, left-hand side, Took care of the mission for five years, did all the odd jobs, took care of that cat for crying out loud. God bless Titus. And uh, thankfully, two weeks before the flood, Titus found a new home. So my worst fears were never realized, worrying about what would happen to Titus. Uh, top photo is the Toronto mission, and the bottom photo is our Aeon group uh, in Oshawa. And the Oshawa mission doesn't look like that at all anymore. There's been so much work done to it. Captain of one of the local cruise ships came in and I was able to take a picture of him. And the top photograph <coughs> is one that's uh, a little unusual. These are five guys that I met in Manila three years ago. And I was standing in the same lineup as them to board the same flight that they were going to board to Taiwan. And I said, so, uh, Seaman, where are you headed? And they looked at me like I was from Mars, but if you see the bottom left-hand side, there's a sort of an envelope with writing on it. That's a special envelope for OFWs, Overseas Filipino Workers. Every OFW, whether they're going to be a nanny or a seafarer or a nurse or whatever, they all have one of those envelopes. So I recognize the envelopes. I've just done two weeks training on how to recognize the envelopes. And I said, I'm with Siemens Club in Canada. Oh, yes, mom, yes, mom. 
We're going, we're going to uh, various countries that we're heading off to. So I fly to Toronto and I get all the way to Toronto and I grab my luggage finally 27 hours later off the luggage carousel and load it into the limo and off we go and my phone rings. Now it's midnight and I'm not sure who it is that's calling me and I answer the phone and this distinctly Filipino voice says, is this Miss Judith? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh really? I said, yes. And he said, you have my luggage. What? And I said, what? And he said, you have my luggage. I have your luggage, which is how I know your phone number. I'm calling you, can you bring me my luggage? So off Fifth Gardner and turn around and go back to the airport. The chap in the red shirt, he said, good thing we met at the airport, huh? He was moving to Canada. He was going to work for a Canadian shipping country, company. His uh, sister was so excited. She lives in Mississauga, so he was going to stay with her for a while. She sent him a luggage tag identical to mine, big Canadian flag. And I just grabbed my luggage and walked away. And he grabbed his and saw that it was mine. He says to me, good thing we met. I said, absolutely. So that young man was hired by a Canadian shipping company. And he emigrated to Canada. He didn't have an OFW envelope. He had immigration papers. So it's not about the building. It's about who we are as missionaries, as mission people. We go out. We take care of the seafarers in whatever way we can. We have done the little things. As you know, one of my favorite books, 90% of Everything, is the title of the book that describes how 90% of everything in the world gets where it's going on board a vessel. There's a ship somewhere with something on it. 90% of the world gets everything from a ship. And the people we meet on those ships feel invisible. They feel nobody knows who they are, nobody understands the work they do, and more importantly, nobody <laughs> understands the sacrifices they make in their own personal lives to make sure we can buy stuff cheap at Joe Fresh or Loblaws or Walmart or the dollar store. Um, we had an incident in Hamilton, dropped off seven Filipino seafarers, uh, went back to pick them up an hour later. We had checked with Walmart, do you accept US money? Yes, we do. Our volunteer, Jeff, wonderful man, drove back, uh, saw that the entire group of seven was surrounded by police. So he called my other chaplain, she called me, and it turns out that the US bills that they had were all legitimate, but they were older currency. So uh, they were accused of using counterfeit currency, and because any of you who know Filipino seafarers, they're usually a pretty jovial group of people. Um, the security officer found their joviality entirely suspicious and called the police. We refer to that incident as shopping while being Filipino, which is about as ridiculous as it sounds. I wrote a letter to the president of Walmart two years ago, May. I am still waiting for a response, and I have not set foot in a Walmart since, nor will I. So, which is, and the ironic part is, those guys bought, brought all that stuff over on their ships for the stupid store, and they weren't allowed to shop there. But they love shopping at Walmart because everything's in exactly the same place in every Walmart store they've ever been in. And so they can never get lost. They always know where they're going. Hmm. Irony. But we have other amazing stories where one night this young man uh, got a call from his family in the Philippines. His wife had gone into labor. He was her labor coach. Uh, the agent was there at 10 o'clock at night, took him over to the mission station in Hamilton where they all had their Wi-Fi clips already plugged in. And he took his, his uh, laptop with him, Skyped into the delivery room in the Philippines, and coached her through her labor and witnessed the birth of his first child online. Now, that may seem to be a bizarre kind of situation, but without the mission to seafarers paying for the Wi-Fi, which no port is putting money into Wi-Fi, let me tell you, the mission to seafarers in every port I've ever gone to is the only place you get free Wi-Fi without having to buy anything, right? No cup of coffee or no dinner or no whatever. So he witnessed his little daughter being born and two years later, he bought her and his wife 
to the mission in Hamilton to show them the Hamilton mission. He was allowed to bring them on board a ship. We have had uh, today, actually, um, probably a half an hour ago, there was a ship in Hamilton Harbor for an entire year, two years ago, called the Ardita. She was under arrest. Very, very long story. Uh, to make it very short, ultimately the Italian company did admit that they were trying to sell the ship and that the $2 million deposit that Blair and McKeel gave them for the ship, uh, they were going to accept and the ship was purchased ultimately completely by McKeel. That ship is being renamed today, the McKeel Spirit, and Pastor Dan is doing the new christening and blessing of that ship in Toronto right now. They're having lunch after the blessing. I, I was so excited because Dan spent a lot of time on the Ardita when it was the Ardita, and for him to be able to do the blessing of the new, newly named ship is absolutely the most appropriate thing that could happen. Um, it was supposed to happen yesterday, but it would have, it, today is the right day, and today is the day that Dan should be doing it. He had a gentleman off of one of the ships, and he was uh, a widower, and he was about to remarry. His wife had died three years before. But his former brother-in-law was very angry with him and wouldn't speak to him. But he lived in Hamilton. So Dan picked him up, drove him up to where his brother-in-law's house was, and they sort of parked down the street. And they talked, and the seafarer told Dan the story. And there were tears, and there were prayers. And after about an hour, the young man said, Okay, I feel better. I'm ready to go. While not actually getting his brother-in-law's blessing, he was able to be in that vicinity and feel a change happen and felt confident about going forward with his new life with another wife. And uh, being a young man in his, in his 30s, I mean, it was a terrible tragedy. And about to start a new life again, he felt a special blessing. We are called the Ministry of Small Gestures. And we love that because some of the things we do, most of what we do, it are the small things, but they are the meaningful things in the lives of so many people. And finally, I would like to especially thank Shellbax for your support over the years to help us with many things. We will, uh, I've, I've actually got an office in, um, in uh, the warehouse, down in warehouse 52 on the port, same address. Um, it's about the size of two tables, but that's okay. It's just for me. Uh, it doesn't have windows to the outside, but it has windows. So I'm sure they look out onto something. Probably the, you know, the driveway or the warehouse. I'm not, I don't care. Um, but we're, we're sort of established again with the same address, which is really helpful, and it's really hopeful. Mission to Seafarers Canada is, um, as you, you heard, uh, the newly incorporated group. The whole country, we have uh, about five new ports we're looking at, four on the west coast and one in the east, and possibly more in the east, but right now those are the ones that we are looking at with a new group and with sort of new vigor and new interest. And um, we, we have, as I said, been around since 1856. We're not going anywhere in a big hurry, but we continue to do the work that is so, so needed. When you know how appreciative they are the seafarers are, and their families, and their families, that somebody's taking care of them, looking out for them, and reminding them that they're not invisible. They are not invisible, they are valued, and the work they do is important. You feel like you're doing the right thing every day. Thank you. <laughs>